Hi, everybody. Aloha. 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 Good to see you all. Hmm. I can spend the whole time just looking at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. How is everybody? Good. Good. Okay. Great. Wow. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Wonderful to see you all again and some folks new and uh, the hope is that this is it. Like now that you've registered, <clears throat> it'll be the same link for at least through the summer. Uh, if for some reason we have to change the password at some point, we can do that. Otherwise it should just be the same. You don't have to re-register every week. Should be nice. Mm. Mm. All right, well, let's get started with a little sitting. <clears throat> we'll start to mute. And maybe just that reminder of you should be muted as you enter, but we'll mute you. Um, if we notice sound arising unexpectedly mm, for this part. <clears throat> so, you know, just as usual, finding a comfortable seated position. <clears throat> some kind of balance between that relaxation and alertness, energized but grounded. And I, I think sometimes it can be helpful just to not just remember, but also experiment with the, in some ways, most basic aspects of the practice. As you're seated here with your eyes closed, to really just try our best to observe everything. To remember that before we apply method or technique or these different tools or strategies or frameworks, the bare simplicity of the practice and the ultimate promise of the practice is really just to be able to observe with as much clarity, tenderness, all the phenomena that are arising and passing in our six sense door field of being. And so that our work here is just to notice everything. To 
to note sounds as they arise and pass. Visual impressions at the eye door as they come and go. Smells and tastes. This wide range of physical experience throughout the body, deep inside and right at the surface. And all of the conjurings of the mind, thoughts and emotions, ideas, inklings, knowings. As we sit here and simply try to attune the attention to this incredible flood of experience we can get a sense that the mind really can be aware of it all. That it takes quite some energy to keep up with it. The sound, the knowing of the sound, the thought about the sound, the image, the name that arises, Sensation in the body, sensation of taste, sensation of emotion. All of these phenomena can be known. The knowing can be known. And there is a value in sometimes just sitting there trying to watch everything as best we can. And sometimes this can be a huge relief. It can get us a little out of the sense that we're trying to do something, build something, control something in our practice. We don't need to actually do anything. All of these phenomena arising and passing on their own. Nothing to work with. Nothing to accomplish. 
we see some things, we don't see others. We get lost in thought. We notice it. Notice what's next. Of course, we do start to realize how overwhelming this flood of experience can be, how hard it is to keep up with all this coming and going. How muddled it can get. without any baseline of stability or to measure from. Sometimes we don't see the motivations behind the mind's movement from one object to another. We don't see the assumption of self as a platform of our observation. Because of all of these things, the world of various methods arise to give us some sense of capacity, some ability to be with the unfolding of this life in a way that feels fruitful in terms of insight. And so while we can simply sit here and observe the firing off of all of these experiences, one after the other, at all of the sense doors, this myriad of sense fireworks, we also start to recognize the value of narrowing the field of attention to one part of these six streams. So that we can develop some of these capacities of concentration, of mindfulness, in a more manageable field. And so while we generally offer a range of anchors, today maybe I'll just encourage the exploration of this movement from the intensity of the six sense door approach just into the 
rising and falling of the abdomen. As the breath naturally moves in and out on its own. And so while we're not shutting off all of these other streams of experience, we can see that the attention can gather in a more concurrent way with just the sensations around the abdomen, this very general area. Increasing pressure or decreasing pressure. increasing or decreasing tightness, tension. Hardness, softness, motion, stillness. not trying to manipulate the breath, but simply trying our best to gently but firmly keep the attention concurrent with the present moment experience of the breath. And just spending some time, perhaps exploring really the different qualities, but the same fundamental baseline between the experience of really staying with this anchor of the rising and falling of the breath, non-conceptual, direct, and the releasing of that anchor and trying to observe as clearly as possible. this wild interplay of the senses, the knowing of what's happening, treating each sense store that same degree of respect, curiosity, worthiness, of being known. And then what it feels like to move back into relationship with this narrower field of attention in the anchor.
I'm going to just say a quick word about that. Um, the instructions just, you know, we, we love our method and our methods and there's so much strength and value. And, you know, we're very rooted in particular in the Mahasi um, approach to this practice. And I think it's always just important to see where any method can have its shadows and, um, start to make us feel sometimes that we don't, um, that like the breath is the important thing, you know, or like that, that being able to watch the breath is, is, is the important, what comes out of this practice. And, and, and that just isn't true. You know, the breath has the ability to teach us everything that we can learn about all phenomena, but uh, um, it's not unique in its ability to do that, that, that any experience that we can observe in the sixth sense or, you know, fields of awareness can teach us the same insights and that it is sometimes just really important to, to remember to just practicing in this other way that's more open, but sometimes more energizing um, because you see how quickly the mind really needs to to be moving and how agile it needs to be to be able to keep up with phenomena as they're really unfolding in their natural way. So um, thank you. And um, yeah, we'll move over to Steve for our uh, talk today. Let me change my visual thing here. Let's see, Steve, I'll unmute you in your video. Let's see, I guess you have to unmute yourself there. There you go. Am I unmuted? Everyone can hear clearly. Great. Good. I went to I went to bed around nine o'clock last night. Um, I, I I never really know what to expect at full moon time, uh, but that's not quite accurate. I do know what to expect at full moon time. Uh, my mom and I were alike in that way. Um, lack of ability to fall asleep <laughs> or easily awaken. Uh, so finally I got out of bed at three o'clock 
and walked outside, uh, looked up, moon overhead, bending toward the sea. And there's a wall um, at the place where I'm staying with the night blooming Sirius growing on it. Uh, and at my mom and dad's house in Honolulu, they had a wall. Uh, one of her very, very favorite plants was a night blooming series that, that grew on that wall. And one of her favorite things was uh, if Michelle and I were home in the summer, this time, July, but mostly August, her, her, her species of night blooming cereus bloomed once a year with the full moon. So we'd come over and have dinner and then go down and sit as the moon would rise over um, Coco Crater uh, in East Honolulu and then just cross over uh, Mauna Lua Bay between Coco Crater, Coco Head in East Honolulu and Diamond Head, which is more down close to town, Waikiki. Uh, and it would just, you know, arc across the sea and as the, the moon would shine, making shimmering silver paths on the sea, uh, right up to our eye door. And leading on from what Jesse just said, even as I'm talking, maybe choose one of the sensitivities. Doesn't matter, one of the six sensitivities, as Jesse said, they're all equally significant, important, and doorways, portals to awakening. Uh, the five physical senses and the mind door uh, of emotions and um, mental formations. So as I'm talking, just see if you can anchor in the eye sensitivity, the ear sensitivity, because the sound of my voice or whatever sounds are around you. Um, fragrance, sensitivity, flavor, sensitivity. And then, you know, the body sensitivity that's continuously uh, in contact with the stream of elemental phenomena the textures, temperatures, vibrations, movement, uh, firmness, support, fluidity, cohesion, heat, coolness, and so forth from, from the elemental nature that is the body, the activities of, of earth element, textures, water element, cohesion, fluidity, fire element, heat and coolness, air element, support, firmness, and oscillation, movement, vibration. To see what is available and see if you can simultaneously anchor to one of these sensitivities, even as you're listening. And the talk today is, well, it's about listening. It's about Empathy. So at three o'clock this morning, <laughs> I went out and I saw the, the last flower because they actually had started to bloom the night before. Their early, early moon bloom for this particular plant species. Uh, when we went to my parents' house, uh, her species seemed to like August full moon. So it would rise and arc across Mauna Lua Bay with that shimmering pathway that moved across between the Coco Head range of mountains toward Diamond Head. And as it would do so, you know, dozens of these night blooming Sirius would respond from the moonlight by opening. And the fragrance was was powerful fragrance moved through the air and entered into that portal of the fragrance sensitivity. And also the, the visual experience of seeing them open 
you know, in t times you could actually see them open faster than the hour hand of a clock. And then they would be in full open bloom, uh, fully fragrant by the time the moon reached Diamond Head and started to set a couple of dozen of, of these night blooming Sirius all be a, just a, like a symphony of color and fragrance and beauty all touching us. And we'd mostly be quiet. It was like my mom's favorite meditation form. Then once the moon once the moon set behind Diamond Head, the flowers would close and never open again. That would be it. It was like watching transients in, in slow motion, impermanence, a Nietzsche, in, in slow motion. Many times our insights see how phenomena are, are so incredibly immediately appearing and vanishing, appearing and vanishing. But some things we get to witness, of course they're doing the, the rising and vanishing. Um, the appearance, existence, and disappearance very quickly. But then there's other cycles that are occurring. So like with the night blo blooming Sirius, as it was opening in the color uh, yellow and white uh, would radiate in the moonlight and as the fragrance would spread out you know within the momentariness of them there was also this cycle that was clearly observable uh, in, in transience and slow motion and then they would close so i was out there until this last blossom closed and it was it's powerful it's powerful beauty and powerful in its life in its existence and powerful in its uh, decay in its diminishing in its death uh, i took some photos of the flowers and the moon and the flowers and the moon together and uh, it flashed. I didn't think it would flash. I didn't need it to flash because the moonlight was so, so bright. And I was a little afraid because at, there's a separate section that went into the house and there's a, a woman staying there for a few months. And I, I didn't want to disturb her. You know, she's over 90 years old. Uh, and the flash was, was startling even to me, because I didn't expect it. I took a few steps back and I looked over at the window, you know, half expecting to see a light go on or a flashlight goes on. But earlier in the evening, there were, there were, there were fireworks uh, going off in, right here in this neighborhood and in the distance, the ones that go up into the air and then explode and disappear. So I was hoping, well, maybe she just thinks it's, mischievous neighbors still blowing up a few firecrackers at 3 a.m. Uh, but apparently it didn't, it didn't disturb her. So, you know, I went back and, and lay down, thought about my mom, and thought about the night blooming serious, and, and feeling all the emotions that come uh, with them and how it's a, such a powerful metaphor for our lives. Uh, and our, our bodies, our, our sentient na nature uh, that has these sensitivities and, and has a life and, and an existence. And, and then at some point, uh, a diminishment in that s slow motion way of the night blooming serious, as well as informed by our insight, um, at times illuminating extraordinary momentariness of everything that we are experiencing. Our, our whole universe is this sixth sense door, uh, loka, loka, the word for, for world. Uh, and um, 
you know, all of the world, all of experience is, is right here in the body. And the, and the senses are simply the extension of the body. Uh, and the mind, emotion, uh, mental formations, all body-based. Uh, there's never a reason to look outside of the body when we're meditating. Everything we need to know about ourselves, about our solar system, about our, our Milky Way galaxy, about moonlight and flowers, is to be known right here, right here in this body. It, at times, it's interesting to investigate how, for example, at the eye door, we go to an external object uh, and then quite often by training and learning and habit, there's the mental proliferation that with memory and, and reflection and comparison and association, we have a narrative about what, what we see. The night blooming series, for example, or, or the sea or this person or that person and so forth. Um, if we bring our attention and turn it inwards, there begins to be the understanding that what is actually happening is light is entering the body. In, in the moment that light has contact with the receptor, the inner sensitivity at the eye door, in that moment there's seeing consciousness. And at that moment, it's not involved with uh, proliferation, embellishment, like naming, oh, the night blooming Sirius, my mom's favorite flower and the, and the full moon flower, and that it, it only blooms once a year, you know, it's life and death. It's simply in that moment of insight awareness, it's simply understanding the phenomena, the mystery, the miracle of sight and visual experience is occurring because of causes and conditions. Light touches the inner sensitivity. In that moment, seeing consciousness is happening. So we could say we do six sense door awareness. We could also say we do six consciousnesses awareness. Uh, because there's only consciousness when there's conditions of contact. Sound vibration, which is air and earth element primarily, and the inner receptivity of the ear door, the moment of contact, the seeing consciousness. At that time, it's not thinking firecracker. It's not thinking uh, symphony. It's not thinking uh, even that person's voice. It's totally being aware of vib that vibration, that vibrating field of sound, field of sound vibration. So, you know, when we look at that, you know, returning to uh, the metaphor of the night blooming Sirius, you know, I could, I could say, yeah, when it closes, it closes. And my thought about, oh, I'm not going to sleep very well tonight, probably. Uh, maybe I could see it tomorrow. Uh, but then my reflection is that, well, there won't be any more blooming on this plant for a year, this, partic this particular species, just once a year. So there can be a melancholy. There can be a sadness. Can, uh, and then taking that same metaphor in, into our life, you know, how, how do we hold that kind of uh, phenomena that when the conditions are no longer there, the, the phenomena pass away, vanish, disappear, uh, not to return, no two sensations alike, no two um, emotions alike. This is the emotion of fear, of desire, of courage, of generosity, love, hate, are all very quick moments. If the conditions are there, 
they keep arising fast enough that it feels like the same, the exact same emotion continuing, the fear or the courage, the love or the anger. But it's, but it's not. So a similar moment of going in uh, to that receptor place in our heart that receives the emotion, that receives the thought formation, can feel that and, and realize, oh, it's just a fear moment, not attach, not need, not need it to go away, not hold on to it. If it's a, a, a beautiful mind state, love, care, joy, uh, but understand the conditionality of it, that, that for a moment it touches. And if the, condi if the conditions are there, it, uh, it can keep arising moment to moment. So in practice, for example, we have those moments where, where joy appears to be continuous because it's arising and passing so quickly. It seems to be one continuous stream rather than the, the discontinuous stream that it is. And we can abide in it. And in our practice, uh, we begin to understand at a certain point that it's, it's, it's joy that, continue, that leads to the happiness and concentration that leads to awakening. W without that joy, without that inner happiness that does not depend on the sense store of pleasures, we're carried to more and more subtle kinds of joy and happiness which allows the mind to collect into that um, beautiful uh, unification called samadhi, kalyana, samadhi, beautiful, unified, collected mind. Uh, and, and so we, we learn how abiding in these joy is, is not attachment. Attachment can arise, uh, and then we can notice that. And then not feel guilty or not feel that it's not practice to again lean back and, and abide in that uh, restfulness, uh, joyous restfulness, or, or peace, or calm, or, or, um, or deep ease, spiritual happiness, sukkha, for as long as it's there. And then when it disappears, it's like the night blooming serious, you know, we let go of it. Sometimes in, in, this, in this practice, doing just what I'm talking about, uh, some old formation arises, sankara, a uh, word for formations that appear that tend to arise when we do practice. A difficult emotion, for example. Uh, so the melancholy I felt watching that last blossom last night. Sometimes we need to, to uh, feel that and understand it, make a shelter for our, our um, sorrow, our grief, our sense of loss. Make a shelter with it. Uh, and the conditions are there where it's, it's sustaining, that is, it's arising and passing quite often. And because it's some perhaps sourced in an old wound, you know, karmic knot. It's, it's, it's there for a while, and it's going to stay there for a while. So we learn how uh, to make space for it, to surround it, perhaps, with this empathy. Now, I was looking up uh, um, meanings of the different, uh, the Pali terms of the Brahma Viharas, the sublime abidings, metta, which is uh, that connecting friendliness uh, that can then bloom and mature into that boundless, universal loving kindness without prejudice, without bias, without discrimination. And likewise with the karuna or compassion, the care that we feel for uh, the suffering of, of a sentient being, our, all sentient beings, that, that at first it feels safest 
when it's closer to us, uh, when we're doing it with someone that we already know or care about, or uh, perhaps a group of children or elders um, that are in danger somewhere. And, and that then becomes an easy starting point to bring out that organic, innate care of that Brahma Vihara. As I've said many times, all the Brahma Viharas are one. They're one mind. Just four facets of one mind. And really by extension, all, all the associated skillful states. So dana, generosity, loving kindness, the care of compassion, uh, the, the joy of mudita, uh, and the, the even emotion of equanimity, the, the stilling, grounding, deep equipoise of upeka, equanimity. The, they're all one. They're all one, like looking at an ikibana, Japanese flower arrangement, just the real skilled ikibana artists make it so that from any angle, it's beautiful. So these Brahma Viharas and their extension, their extensions in, in metta, in patience, uh, in cur courageous energy, uh, in all the other associated uh, beautiful states, we can assume they're always there. Sayada Upandita would frequently say a, a, a moment, a single moment of pure sati, pre verbal mindful awareness, that awareness that comes out of this Eightfold Path wisdom. It, it, it's not other kinds of mindfulness, um, more secular kinds of mindfulness. This is a profound wisdom kind of mindfulness. But that moment, draws like a magnet, what I've just been saying, all these other associated skillful states, they're all there. And if we turn the awareness like in a circular fashion or a global fashion, we can start to sense how they're all there and how they're all intertwined and how they're growing. So I was looking up for other terms of, of uh, karuna, compassion. I was looking for something that would embrace all the Brahma Viharas because I was interested in, in empathy and, and the spread of empathy, the embrace of empathy. And, and I, uh, in my sense that empathy includes all the Brahma Viharas and all the other associated skillful states. Uh, and I found in the Pali dictionary, uh, this term, um, anu, anu, Anukampa, Karuna, Anukampa, Karuna, uh, and, and its direct translation is uh, is trembling, trembling. Uh, when we taught, when we teach the practice of of Karuna as a Brahma Vihara, uh, we, we talk about uh, a an ap approximate cause for the karuna to emerge from the heart, you know, where it's always resting, is to attune to the helplessness of a suffering being. So attuning to the helplessness of a suffering being, being can draw out that, uh, that karuna. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's said that, that the care that we feel is like this this trembling that's part of the attunement to that person's suffering. We don't take on the suffering in, a, in an identified way. We don't feel that trembling is not meaning that uh, we're identified with it so much that, that we're suffering in a way that becomes grief and sorrow that has its place. As I've said, when the grief and sorrow is there, we make a shelter for it. And then at the right time or when we need to or when it seems uh, appropriate or skillful means, uh, our awareness enters that shelter and, uh, and feels that particular sorrow 
our grief goes through it with the awareness and wisdom and compassion. So the, the Anukampa uh, felt like, uh, oh, actually another definition besides trembling was um, vibrating after. Like when we ring a bell and we hear the initial vibration of the gong when the, when the striker hits the bell and then the reverberation from it, the continuation of it. You know, so it's not like a moment of care and then perhaps we move on to something else. Rather, there's a, a, the vibrating after as we can, the continuing care moments appearing, another care moment appearing, another care moment appearing. And then because of the equanimity uh, as such a powerful ground and anchor, uh, we can sustain that care, which is always a pleasant feeling tone. Uh, and uh, because of that wisdom and equanimity, it doesn't slide in, into the near enemy of, of grief or sorrow or pity. Uh, and we're able to sustain an enlarged mind and heart to act on that care, to make a difference if we can with just our presence, sometimes our silence, our kind words, or some action that we take to alleviate the person's pain or for that person to feel our attunement to them, our, our trembling, our vibrating after, that the care is real and, uh, and a stable stream, a sustaining stream. So the first person continues to feel cared for, e even if their, their, their suffering goes on and goes on. Uh, uh, an, an ailment or a trauma that is constant, constant in their lives. Uh, so too, this Anukampa Karuna uh, continues to embrace and hold that person's pain, that being's pain, wh whatever sentient being it is. If we have, if we have pets, we have kitties or cats or dogs or puppies. You know, we have the same feeling for them, and it's easy, really easy, to use them as a compassion subject when we're practicing compassion, or a mudita, empathetic joy, when we're practicing mudita, when they're happy and playful and they're bringing us joy and they're happy to see us. Nothing like coming home, you know, and, and your pet is really happy to, happy you're there. <laughs> uh, and my dog, uh, my youth, my childhood and youth dog, uh, you know, learned to smile. And so I'd, I'd come in and, and Benji actually would make a smile, you know, wag his tail and smile at me uh, and others and others as well. So it's, it's helpful to think that, that all, these, all these capacities are there because, you know, sometimes it feels like uh, the connection of friendliness and loving kindness it just isn't working toward ourselves or toward another, uh, which is often a signal. Um, maybe it's a good time to call up that, that fearless compassion, that sustained, trembling, caring quality. Uh, and then uh, as I've been uh, contemplating now, the, the word empathy is all the Brahma Viharas in embracing ourselves or in other sentient beings or all of life or the planet at once, at once. And, and as the conditions call for, one, one of them steps forward. So real compassion we know is, is, has stepped forward when the tone of that care is, is pleasant. If it's not pleasant, then, then it's, it's not the, the real karuna. It, it's something we need to visit at another time, the grief, the sorrow, the pity, the worry, the concern. Uh, if we can set it aside, uh, 
The caring is the most powerful. It's what people take in as, as nurture, as being seen. You know, empathy is, is being seen, S seen and being seen uh, when it goes back and forth. And uh, hearing and being heard when it's reciprocal. Uh, feeling and, and felt, you know, I feel you and, and the sense of being felt by another. The, the embrace of that um, anukampa karuna, uh, the, f the full embrace. And so when mudita is, is, is necessary, and yeah, yes, in the beginning, we can direct it with our wise reflection. Uh, but after some practice, it, it's like a, a, a symphony. It's, it just steps forward on its own effortlessly. So when there's cause for appreciation, in our culture, we were taught comparing and competition and striving and driving uh, for, for success and what, whatever that we were uh, learned or are pushed or driven to do. Uh, but genuine uh, appreciative awareness, appreciative consciousness is, is simply taking delight and feeling joy wherever there's happiness. Generally, we start with someone um, that's safe and who we adore, who's clo uh, close to us. Uh, and there's, uh, we, we don't, we're not tempted to feel envy or jealousy. We're immediately happy. Just thinking of them being happy makes us smile. Uh, so that's, that's often what we offer, that image. Your, your, your close person, our, our animal pet being, imagining them at their, at their happiest moment or feeling them now as they are happy, wherever they be. And then the native response of the heart that appreciates, that feels joy, takes delight in that happiness, that artistic beauty that creativity, whatever form, whatever form that happy experience is, near or far, and then to abide in that appreciative joy because it feeds us, it nurtures us, it carries, carries us further along the path of, of awakening and builds the joy response in us instead of comparing. It's so rare culturally, speaking, so rare that we, that we have this appreciative interest, you know, rather than a comparing one or a competitive one. And then this anukampa empathy that trembles and, and continue, continues to vibrate after includes the emotion of equanimity, upeka which means to look upon or to look over. The sense of looking upon life, our own, uh, our friends, our community, uh, all sentient life, all beings, the planet, the solar system, the galaxy, to, to look upon as opposed to looking away. Looking away would be the near enemy of Upeka, where we disconnect, where we numb out, dissociate. Sometimes that is our defense, to go numb, to disconnect, to disassociate, uh, to be indifferent. That defense protects us when we can't feel, when we feel overwhelmed, swept away, or just a tsunami kind of emotion, to step back, to a, either another Brahma Vihara again, back to caring for that pain, or if necessary, uh, the, the near enemy, the skillful use of um, normally a non skillful state that's disconnected from life or disconnected from a suffering being. Temporarily, we borrow going into that dissociation 
going into that shutdown or that numbness. I guess we probably learned to do that a long time ago when we didn't have the wisdom. So we do that and then we can later shift to just a restful place. We wake up, rest, relaxation, seclusion, restorative. And, and then again, we can call up. Equanimity is, is the subtlest of, of the Brahma Viharas because it has the most wisdom. Uh, and it's a neutral feeling tone. Whereas the other Brahma Viharas uh, have pleasant feeling tones, loving kindness, the care of compassion, of course, the, the, the joy uh, and appreciation of, of mudita, empathetic joy, and, and the other associated states like uh, dana, generosity, and patience, truthfulness. Uh, all of them are, are available. All of them are there. Uh, and uh, they're all part of this empathic embrace, this anukampa. Uh, and after some time, you know, uh, when we consciously pick and choose, for example, balancing care and equanimity, you know, to care about something um, profoundly, uh, but if it gets to the point of, of overwhelm, of triggering and bringing out some old wounds and traumas in ourself or in others, to be able to step into the peace and stillness and regeneration that's provided by the, the wisdom of equanimity, the balance of equanimity that soothes, regulates our system. And then we can see clearly. Then we know what a skillful action might be, often doing nothing, uh, but abiding in care, or abiding in appreciation, or abiding in friendly connection. So it's that wisdom that decides, not our mental conceptual process. And knowing that difference um, is part of the skillful means included in this empathy that I'm talking about. So now it's getting close to the end. I want to read this poem uh, by uh, Jane Herschel called The Wayne. The Wayne, the heart's reasons Seeing clearly, even the hardest will carry its whip marks and sadness and must be forgiven. As the draught starved Elan, the Elan is the largest of the antelopes. Uh, Michelle and I visited Botswana in the mid 80s and saw these magnificent creatures that were part of the ancient San culture. They worshiped them. They drew them tens of thousands of years ago in cave paintings, and they also depended on them for life. They ritually killed and then ate, ate them. So as the drought-starved Elan forgives the drought-starved drought lion, who finally takes her, enters willingly then the life she cannot refuse and is lion is fed and does not remember the other. So few grains of happiness measured against all the dark and still the scales balance. So few grains of happiness measured against all the dark and still the scales balance. The world asks of us only the strengths we have and we give it then it asks more and we give it that poem for me is this like um, the Anu Kampa it's so empathic, uh, seeing, seeing life and death as it is. Uh, there's a moment, they say, I learned from a tracker in, when we were in Botswana. There's a moment when the prey of the leopard, or the prey of the lion, 
such as the Elan, um, surrenders, completely lets go. And, and then Jane Hirschfield's poem, you know, I, she just nails it. She just gets it. As the drought-starved Elan forgives the drought-starved lion who finally takes her, enters willingly then the life she cannot refuse, and is lion, is fed and does not remember the other, does not remember her Elan self. This is life and death in the African savanna. This is life and death on Mother Earth. This is life and death in our solar system, in our Milky Way galaxy, in the bursting of, of, of massive star systems and their ending into white dwarfs, the explosion into being, and then going cold and hard and dense. So, uh, I, I, I will end there. I will end here um, and, and remind us all that uh, to, to trust, to have faith, uh, even when there's doubt, to have faith in these qualities of, uh, that constitute empathy, that, that if we listen carefully, uh, these qualities have their own intelligence. They're much smarter than our thinking mind, our conceptual stream. Uh, and as Upandita once said to me, side by side with this conceptual stream, these forces of awakening continue to develop, even if the conceptual stream seems so much faster. It doesn't matter with every moment of purity of awareness, purity, of empathy, has this tremendous effect, like the vibrating afterwards. So, thank you. I can't hear it unless you unmute, Michelle. So what should we do now? Should we take a question or two or, yeah? Sounds great. Okay. Yeah, does it, if anyone has any questions, the, the best process we've been doing at this point has been, <clears throat> um, you know, if you click on the sort of uh, participant little window there, you, there should be a little raise hand button. And so if you raise your hand, it'll sort of show up over here and we can call on people as they, as they do that. And really just again, the reminder that it's, you know, questions about Steve's talk, about the instructions, uh, or about your practice um, in any ways that we might be able to support you. We will let Michelle take the lead on that. Okay, it looks like Sun, are you there? Sun? Oh. Sun, I'm so trying I, to, there we go, hi. Uh -huh. Hi everyone. So my question is like, wisdom is all in the four Brahma, Brahma Viharas, right? Even the kindness, Mitta and Karuna and... They're all what, Sun? Yeah. What about them? They are all um, have wisdom in yes. all of them. There, there's wisdom to all of them. There's degrees of wisdom to all of them. Especially when we bring the Vipassana awareness to feel them, to, to really understand. When, when we do that, then the metta grows and becomes more pure. And the compassion does the same. And the joy, empathetic joy, does the same. Another way, I think languaging is um, interesting. It's like when we use the word kindness or love for metta, 
the um, assumption is that it's kindness infused with wisdom. It's like, it's not, it's, it's meant to be inextricably infused or like the compassion that the attention connects with compassion, but that that compassion is infused with wisdom, et cetera, that you connect with joy and it's confused with wisdom. That's how you prevent them becoming aversion or attachment. It's like there's the understanding with the kindness. So you're not trying to control with love or you're not trying to um, get rid of it pain in the world or you're not trying to uh, make joy like pleasure or stay um, so there's this when you try to explain what these mean we have to always start there so yes it, it, there's that sense that each Brahma Vihara the de by definition is, in, is infused with wisdom which is why we teach them together because it's possible to practice the Brahma Viharas without the wisdom and then identify with them as my boundless love or, or my care and compassion, my joy, my equanimity. Uh, that, that was actually happening at the time of the Buddha that the Brahma Viharas were already being practiced. But as, as concentration practices and practitioners are, are leaders and teachers would then identify with those very subtle states and they would feel that, that it was that it was under their control and they were identified uh, and then the power the gravity the magnetism of such powerful qualities as the brahma viharas could be misused so the Buddha brought them in in service of wisdom. And, and we follow that tradition. We bring them in as Vipassana Brahma Viharas, for example. So it's love that loves. You know, it's metta that metas. It, it's, it's, it's karuna that karunas. Care that cares. Not I, not me, not mine. Equanimity, balance that balances. Not I'm balanced. I have this balanced, peaceful, wide heart and mind. That clear, Sun? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see the, even in the Metta Sutta at the end, it says that if one's practiced Metta it will, you know, and achieve it, one will not be reborn again in this world. So that's, that is insight to liberation described in the Sutta, right? Yes, I've heard that. That, I've heard that. And, and actually how I learned to practice from Upandita was to use the Brahma Viharas either side by side with the Vipassana uh, development or as stepping stones. Like when this overwhelm uh, it, by Dukkha in the Vipassana to re rest in one or other of the Brahma Viharas to regenerate, recalibrate, renew and then return, return to the phenomena uh, be, because of the intensity of seeing phenomena again and again arise and pass away. One grows weary, one grows tired, one can easily be overwhelmed, want to run away. <laughs> and I think it's important to recognize, you know, Tan, that, uh, you know, that is, uh, as I've studied more, you know, that is, it's a, that phrase in the Karniya Metta Sutta has been a point of like controversy for a thousand years, you know, because there is this understanding. There's like both. There's like the Sutta says that through the practice of Metta, one can end your lifetimes. You won't come back to being reborn. And then everywhere else, it also says that actually Metta is not enough. That because Metta isn't necessarily investigative, right? It's not, there's not uh, an investigative quality into the nature of phenomena that it actually can't produce insight on its own. And so I think that it's just like one of these things that's a great place where the more we practice, the more we learn. <laughs> and then we just, it's like, where's that exploration for us? Where, where do we find the places of metta 
that feel like are very much infused with wisdom and that there's a relationship to objects as they arise and pass that's clear seeing but also loving and then where is there times maybe where we're just um enchanted with oneness and with this sort of like fixation on connectedness and unity and start to see that wow that's actually maybe a little bit out of balance maybe that doesn't have so much of the sort of like wisdom disenchantment aspect of it so i think it's it's such a cool thing when you start to study these you know that there's there are contradictions or, or places that might appear to be contradictory or that are just good things to keep exploring that's fun my, my thinking is that if, if we start to apply some investigation into the quality of matter and observe it as, as a mindfulness of the mind, then wisdom can develop from, from that aspect of investigation. It's actually wisdom that is investigation. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, so the, Vichara, the word for investigation to... is just another word for wisdom. Right. And I, I so, think so that wisdom that, is there from the beginning, the first moment of mindfulness, there's some wisdom. And as the mindfulness grows stronger and more continuous, and the mind gets more concentrated, there's wisdom comes along just organically, naturally. Thank you, Steve. I think um, that's why the emphasis in any, anything that I ever read or practice is that metta is and see, real metta is infused with wisdom. So that you have to get that if, if you don't, if you're having a pain in your knee or a pain in your, anywhere in your body and you connect your attention there with metta, kindness, and then you start wanting the metta to get rid of that pain that's actually controlling. That's not metta. Metta is not aversion. Metta is including the equanimity, like, like the vipassana equanimity, or else that we will start using love as a way to control people. We'll want to control people or control animals or control... <laughs> everything without the wisdom so i think that when you start actually understanding this you start to see that you could never wish all beings well if you didn't have wisdom because the people the beings that you didn't want to be around or that you're having difficulty with you couldn't feel that type of them. You, you can't you have to have the deep acceptance of how things are and how beings are beings are imperfect so if you want perfect people then you're going to have trouble uh, and the think that you're failing at the meta or that other people are failing at the meta but it's because there isn't that infusion of understanding even of what meta is it, it has to include wisdom or, or compassion uh. yeah. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. I like to the Anukampa Karuna. This is the first time I hear the term. Steve? Say that. Anukampa Karuna. What about it? Okay, it's in the text. It's heard. in the old text. Yeah, right. Oh, mm -hmm. I've heard of it, but I just decided to talk about it today. And, and I've been contemplating the term empathy and i wanted to know if there was a, a poly equivalent and so coming across and, and looking up it was also used by the jain tradition the jains were around the same time that the buddha was around uh, and so it's, it's both in sanskrit and poly that term uh, uh, anakampa karuna and it just feels more embracing and it feels like it has innate wisdom in it. So it feels like, like mm -hmm. empathy with, with wisdom, empathy with wisdom, inclusive of the, the Brahma Vihara. The Brahma Vihara is the inseparable Brahma Vihara. If, if one is up, they're all up. And according to mm -hmm. conditions, one of them steps forward, but the others are very close at high. So even when that um, neutral toned equanimity is there, it doesn't mean, the reason it doesn't mean that it's indifference 
is because friendliness, care, and joy are very, very close, right next, touching the equanimity, actually. The thus, the meaning of upeka is to look upon, to look over. Care and connection are there by nature. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a good term to, to think of. Uh, Anakampa Karuna. So, so final question uh, regarding the Brahma Viharas. So we can direct the, the practice one way or the other, right? If we just keep holding on to the feeling of Brahma Viharas to concentrate the mind that we would lean toward the, the concentration practice, but we stop holding on but start opening to more investigation to understand its true nature that would be more toward vipassana. Is that correct? I, ideally, the vipassana is traveling alongside all the time. That, that, that they're in, from the beginning, the Brahma Viharas are in service of wisdom. They're in support of wisdom. There, there is, a, there is a, a, the Buddha also taught that you can, uh, that side by side with the seven factors of awakening, right? Mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, and then calm, concentration, equanimity. Side by side, you can practice each Brahma Vihara, which infuses, empowers, develops, matures. It's like in the 10 paramis, the parami of, of metta is what catalyzes and unifies the paramis. So, in the, so we want wisdom always to be there. We want to always invite that, that wisdom awareness so that there's no, from the beginning, there's an attitude of non-attachment, non-identification. That it's the metta that metas, that the compassion that cares. If, if, if you're um, starting to, Tan, if you're starting to get absorbed in the um, metta or compassion or mudita or upeka from vihara, if there's a sense that you're getting absorbed, then the, with the vipassana you do, Technically, you do shift out of that absorption and you notice that disappear and then you, you're starting to notice sound, sight, smells disappear, you know, coming and going. So technically, if you're doing, if you're con if you're doing the, met the Brahma Vihara as a concentration, you don't, you don't have investigation happening. You don't have the seven factors happening. But the way we're offering this right now is without that absorption. We're just saying to see if you can, um, if you notice metta come, you don't, you're mindful of the metta, but you're not getting absorbed in it. You're still with the moment to moment experience with the kindness. It's, a, it's like an affectionate awareness with the moment to moment six sense door experience. I hope that's mm -hmm. yeah. I And it, if but it I, is dropping into, if it is dropping into <laughs> absorption, the, the, the intention of the practice is then from the absorption you do, as Michelle says, you, you, you pre, um, you have an intention, a resolve that you come out of the absorption and observe it dissolve, as she says. So that makes it, even when we're absorbed, that makes it in service of the wisdom awakening. So my question is, can we can direct the intention at the, that time to to have it leaning toward the the concentration practice or toward the wisdom practice, right? We can direct our mind one yes. way or the other. We have that choice, correct? That's true. Right. That's correct. Yeah, so, and I, I think it's just important to recognize that it's so fine tuning, and it's all worth exploring. Like like. You know, if if we're maybe more invested in a non-absorptive kind of integration of uh, loving kindness and investigation, that doesn't mean that it's like wrong to do pure loving kindness practice. You know, and like there are going to be 
you know, there are millions of, of people throughout the ages who have done mostly that, who have said, I'm going to focus on Metta, or I'm going to focus on Karuna for the next 50 years. And from there, and from that stability, and from my investigation into this process of all the, what are the obstacles to feeling Karuna in this moment and that, you know, purify the mind in these other ways, and then do the kind of classical observing of it dissipate. So, you know, it's all worth exploring. Can you imagine a situation in which we said, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get absorbed in that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's all beautiful. It's good to practice. It's good to try different things. And I think there's like these standards. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like, yeah, so there are these methods and they're so beautiful and there's so many. And most methods came because someone learned from their teacher that method and it worked from them, or they found their own way that worked for them and then sort of standardized it and taught it to other people. So that we have to recognize we're all gonna have some element of that at play that actually, wow, Metta might be just the doorway for you to just to come alive and to have your practice flourish. For other people, it might be equanimity. And to know that like, we have to have, feel some sense of power in our own practice to, to do that exploring, you know? So I just feel glad that you're, you're that sounds, like to hear you say, if we, you know, to, to, to incline towards the, the Brahma Vihara most of the time, I mean, it's just like makes you smile how, how wonderful a notion that is, you know, or, or, the, or the investigation or the, you know, the wisdom. I think it's, it's also beautiful to be doing it, whatever, whatever choices we make, you know, yeah. Um, uh, Mia, let's see, are you there? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the teaching today so far. Um, my question may have just gotten answered, <laughs> so I'll try it. Anyways. Um, I'm appreciating the discussion of, I guess, what I would call the relational field, that at times we can dilate our senses to come into relationship with human and non-human, and then at times we are practicing um, limiting or closing the aperture of the dilation. And I was wondering if in our practice, in our lineage, if there was a particular teaching or a set of skills that apply, that when we do open and we do come into relationship, let's just say with tree or bird or, and the other begins teaching itself to us where we're not actually, um, you know, um, glomming on or wanting more, but simply in the openness of the relational field, there is a, a clear space and a, a bit of a download or a, a wisdom that arises as the other teaches itself. Is it, are we meant to, uh, in the middle of that stream, close and say, no, that is um, us, you know, finding attachment in the relationship, or would there be a way to sustain openness, non-attachment, while still becoming a student of the, of the phenomenon? I think I can start. I, I think it's a very good question and maybe take a long time to answer. Um, I think that the, um, the idea of this practice is that every moment becomes your teacher like every sound, sight, smell, taste, touch, that emotion is, is your teacher. Like that will be the great wisdom. And there'll be times when um, we, would, we would encourage kind of in a pure mindfulness, moment to moment instruction, if you could, now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, the question would be, is that a non-conceptual experience? It's like, are, is it, is it, are you receiving something non-conceptually or, or is it becoming conceptual? And that would be an interesting place to investigate. Well, what are we learning? Or, or is it something deep, deeper like that non-conceptual receiving of, of a gift from Sometimes we get these gifts from beings that make it worth living. You know, we feel, we feel connected, right, in a way that is so powerful and important and meaningful. But in this practice, we wouldn't um, necessarily 
um, as you say, the attachment to that can um, become visible and that we would want to repeat it again. <laughs> That's how you'd see, right? You'd see like, um, and if you do, you just, you're with that, you'll see, oh, I did actually get attached to that. And it's that learning, it's just learning to be with how that all unfolds, to not, to not need, not to need that to happen again or ever, but usually that happens when we're not needing it to happen. So I don't know if I'm going in, you know, if there's a piece of what I said that you might have a response to, because it's um, an interesting question. The last few words of what you said didn't um, come across on my computer anyways. You oh. said, uh, we would be wondering um, if we ever wanted it to happen again, but then I didn't, didn't hear the end of the sentence, which felt really significant. Yeah. I don't know if you're... It's, I think it, or, part of the teaching is that if something does happen between us and another being, um, that often the initial moments of it are non-conceptual. We feel deeply connected, and it's in that deep connection that whatever we're receiving in terms of the teaching, it often comes that deeply. And then we might make it into something conceptual, but that's not the most important part. That's what I would say. That it, yeah. it's usually that sense of, um, It's like a, the magnificence of the possibility of con connection without, without any interference in between. Mm -hmm. And that usually happens non-conceptually. Mm -hmm. And what she said was, it happens usually when you're not needing it. Like, so that it actually, the question of whether the, the kind of clinging around it kills it, it's also, it w will or it can, but also that like, usually that's kind of connection happens when actually that clinging isn't there, when that, that grasping quality of the mind isn't there. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I think it's like Stephen's story of, of, sorry, the, of the Night Blooming Sirius, you know, there's a sense of like, okay, there is something in the external world that is profoundly evocative. And now there's going to be elements of that that are memory. There's going to be elements of that that are emotional based on memory. And there's going to be moments of that that are non-conceptual in the moment of like this arising and passing and the fleetingness and the beauty and the poignancy and the kind of liberatory aspect of that experience it's not just one or the other, right? Like if you hear of that, like these metaphors that are used, it's it's both, right? That the experience of insight doesn't exclude memory or cognitive process, but it's also not happening through them. And so it's just like a, you know, it's a conundrum, but there are plenty in the, in the suttas and, you know, the, all the old stories of people coming to, you know, profound liberation through of insight relationship to some external human relationship or phenomenal relationship. So, I mean, I think there is that sense of sensitivity of all the sense stores and to our concepts of our things, this interplay with them and the appropriate relationship to them, distinguish, it, it, it takes apart that distinguishing aspect of, oh, is this other teaching me something? Because the, the self and other stop being meaningful distinctions in those moments. Right, and just to, to add to that, the oneness that is experienced in that relational field is total receptivity, not, not just from other sentient beings, from all things, from rocks, from trees, from ocean, from sky, from moon, from flower. Being in that relational field, mm -hmm. then everything is a teaching, everything is a gift, everything is an, an awakening moment. Yeah, I guess I'm appreciating the camera angles you're presenting, and I appreciate the discipline, Michelle, that you're suggesting, which is don't look for it again. It was a miracle. And both of you are saying, yeah, there's a relational field that is happening, and sometimes it's memory, and sometimes it's new, and who knows? I guess it begs the question, um, uh, 
the conscious, well, it's too big a question. <laughs> um, the perception of what we're training in ourselves, what we're disciplining and, and crafting in ourselves, are we, we're, we're not the only beneficiaries. And um, who knows, um, like the question is, is the, the, other, the otherness of the moon or the otherness of the night blooming flower or of the large antlered animal or the lion, who knows who's revealing themselves at any given moment. And I think that's my interest is how to contend with the othernesses, not decline relationality while still crafting the discipline. It's just a big question, I guess. I would say just, you know, it's something we could, I would like you to ask that question again, you know, because there's so much in it, but I think for now, from, from my perspective, that's happening all the time. Like that's happening with the, the stars, the sun, the grass, it, all of us, sound, sight, smells, taste. It's just that we're not aware of it. So what we're crafting is the ability to become aware of that every moment, that that's actually happening every moment. Okay. Yeah, so that the awareness we're cultivating is to grasp that we don't make it happen. And I think no being or anything makes it happen. You more, you more drop into that realm of truth, that that's the truth, always. Mm -hmm. That's one way to see it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I have something quite to say, but it, you know, it's, it's, it is, it, I think there's the level of just like, where do you take, where do we each take responsibility for our role in that also, where it's not just things revealing themselves to us, but where are we blessing the beings and the, you know, the refrigerator and the plants and the whatever, like, where do you take responsibility for that part of your, the relational quality energetically? And none of it's going to be how what you think about it or how you're analyzing it or how it's you know how we make sense of it ultimately is you know there's a huge range of that but the reality of like what's that experience in the mind in the heart in the body in all the senses of the kindness and the interest and where do we lose that where do we gain it and and ultimately we only have responsibility and only have any authority or power over our own volitional um, aspect of that. Yeah. For me, it's a, 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 an awesome, profound, also um, mystery, you know, and how, like how the Buddha said that a single intentional thought has consequences uh, throughout the universe and universes beyond anything that we can imagine, you know, which, which, um, uh, which, which attunes really to like quantum physics, relational understanding today, so that the power and knowing what our intention is, our motivation is in any given moment and, and how it influences our thoughts, our speech and our actions having some appreciation that in that relational field, every moment is affecting everything. Like when you touch a spider's web, it, it affects the, the whole entire web and the spider's intelligence can read exactly, knows exactly what has touched it, a leaf or an insect or something it wants or doesn't want. That, that kind of interconnectedness, I love that mystery. And there's, there's no conceptuality that can bring it into some focus with, with words, with conceptual words. But the felt sense of it through our practice is, is quite profound, especially in deep, like in a, in a deep concentration of a, of a pasana type of jhana, where there is that sense of oneness and being a part of a relational field not controlling anything, not wanting or not wanting. The wanting and more, or not wanting, or as Jesse suggested, the sense of 
out there, in, in there, outside, inside, out there, in here, disappears. And, and yet, and yet, every moment, there's more knowing, there's more understanding, there's, there's more freedom, there's more sense of connectedness with everything and the, and, and the emptiness of anyone controlling it. Hmm. Okay, um, uh, Sandra, you, let's see. Sandra, okay, think, there you go. I, I think that I have a lot already. I, I think just I'm, since I pushed my button, I think I'm, I have a lot to think about. So I think I won't ask my question. My question was more about what if you're in the opposite of, but in the most acute and inescapably horrible suffering situation of someone else suffering that you cannot um, do anything about and it's immediate and present. It's not like people far away somewhere that you can think about with sympathy or with empathy, but right in your own, <clears throat> right within your own immediate world. Um, but yeah, but I think that a lot of what, a lot of the things you just said apply. And, I think but that's a good I question also, though. We yeah, should jump on it. Yeah. <laughs> we should just save it. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly, particularly what you're say, referring to, but if there's any kind of trauma, you. yeah, why don't you tell us? Oh, okay, this is like the ultimate. Um, my neighbor of 30 years, I live in a farming, you know, kind of ranchy area, um, has a cow and a two month old calf um, about 300 feet from me. I can see them every day. And um, the other day, um, he decided that he was going to wean the calf. So he took the calf, the mother cow was tied up, and put the calf out of the mom's mother's sight or, and reach. And she started to bellow and bellow and bellow. And the calf was crying and crying and crying. And this went on for two days. And the first day, I, you know, I hadn't slept all night. And I'm ready to scream. and. Uh, um, thinking about the irony of the mother cow and the calf and, you know, those kinds of things coming through, but just basically helpless because I have a iffy relationship with him as it is. He doesn't really care for my ideas about things, um, but we get along, you know. So I asked him politely if there was something that he could do about this because I was really being affected by the suffering of these animals and also could not sleep and also need to work from home. Um, online, you know, and there's this you know, horrible thing going on. So after the second night, um, the other neighbors were in on it too. So he stopped, he put them back together. Um, but during this time of this, uh, the intensity of wanting to run away, wanting to go out in the night with a flashlight and a knife and cut the rope so that the two animals could get together. Um, um, and, and thinking about how, uh, how, how do I st stay with this and not just run away from it? I can't, you know, I would, I, you know, had a pillow over my head to try to sleep, but then I didn't feel like I could, you know, just needing to do something about it was um, the number one. There was no chance of, uh, there was so much karuna. I was drowning in karuna. I was immobilized by, by but that's the, like what Steve said, there's the, the, um, the grieving, the opposite, I guess that's not the same as being, having the, and there's no capability of equanimity in that situation. Compassion is a, compassion feels pleasant. It feels good. I know. Yeah, so, <laughs> but I think that, I think you I'm did really that. well. I think you and the neighbors did great. You, I mean, compassionate, action you took compassionate action and i think yeah. if you're referring to those two days usually you just do the best you can you know i might at some point cows are very sensitive and so if you even were far away but just stood there if there was any any sense that an animal knows you're around and send meta they feel it usually like it or with the baby calf it's like 
this the idea that there's no separation really and that you can lay in bed and send the metta or send Which yourself I, I i was doing that yeah mm. and but send it yourself felt, yeah, it felt like not enough mm. yeah it's uh mm. this is a human uh dukkha it's like the dukkha dukkha of Big se- that sense of contact separation contact separation the mother the, the, we have this idea that when the umbilical cord is, is cut, that we're separate. And that's the whole focus of meditation is to learn that that's not true. Yeah. Well, and right. anybody, any, any mammal who's nursed their baby knows that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's exactly, I mean, it's, a, it's like the perfect, <laughs> horrible <clears throat> teaching about all of the Brahma Viharas, right? Which is that, you know, the, cause, cause, because as you're recognizing, you know, the, the mother and baby calf is like the classic metaphor of, <laughs> of metta. And so what to do when that's ripped apart or threatened and, you know, you, it's just to say that it's like you tried all of those tools and what you come to is really partly this recognition that all of the love in the world isn't going to stop something happening. You, it actually love, love, like that's the whole point of why equanimity is included in the Brahma Viharas. It's the acknowledgement of the like, limitations of the capacity of our love to make things yeah. the way we want them to be. And yeah. so it's like, that's the other part of it, of like, there are things out of our control. Now you happen to have encountered a situation in which you realize you actually could do something and that you could, you know, you individually or the neighbors gather, you organize. And so there's important lessons in that, right? Of like where you know, where do we have some ability to lessen suffering? And what is the motivation? You know, are we, you know, bringing our torches and pitchforks to the guy's house? Or are we, you know, how does that work, right? And what is the, what are we cultivating in that effort and that organizing Mm -hmm. and in that, and there's going to be countless, countless, countless sufferings in this world, which you're going to feel and we're all going to feel more and more distantly capable of doing anything about Uh, to the degree to which as like a more sort of aggregate of like suffering in general there is just this if we don't have some ability to acknowledge the need for our hearts for that coolness of equanimity at some point of like that beings are the owners of their actions that we we actually cannot save all beings that we we can alleviate the suffering of all beings and that's very very hard for the heart to bear and that that sense of of things are the way they are and the acceptance of that truth not condoning whatever behavior might be leading to other people's suffering but some piece of acknowledgement of our the limitations of our power to control um is an important and fundamental part of the practice and so Mm -hmm. it's horrible and yet how fortunate that you had like a positive outcome with this uh you know for now who knows uh, what your neighbor will yeah, come up with for, next, yeah. or the other neighbor yeah, on the yeah. other side. I'll be the, I'll be the object. Of we the we didn't have that in New Zealand, Michelle. Huh? When we were teaching at, at the Tibetan center, and we were next to the sheep farm, right, right. and they separated the young ones, like two hundred, two or three hundred young ones. We had two hundred crying. Yeah, crying. During a retreat. It was a sheep farm in New Zealand. During the retreat. It's sheep. For, day, it's for days. Sheep. We had 200 baby calves, you know, and mother separated. And the, they were crying for days. And we were all having yeah. to sit with it. But I think this is when you learn acceptance, deep, unconditional acceptance, doesn't mean you get rid of the pain in the world. And that's what we want. That's the... That's what the deal, the deal we want is that we're going to show up for this and, and really work hard and send metta and be accepting. But then we think we should have control. And that's where yeah. this, that's where the wisdom piece is so important. But also that doesn't mean when we accept it, that then we don't send metta. You see, then we don't just throw metta out. You do both. And it, what a great teaching. Yeah really hard and and with equanimity that you can still have the acceptance and still act and again that's coming from this place of oh i'm gonna act to try to help this being not because i can't handle the grief 
but because I care. And those are two totally different approaches and two totally different experiences internally and with usually totally different results. And to really take that in, it's like actually the more equanimity I can feel about this suffering, the more able I'm actually going to be able to be to alleviate it. Versus if I just can't deal with my own anxiety and grief around it and I come wrathfully from that and try to project that feeling to someone else, we see how the neighbor is going to work, right? It's like, and then the escalation that develops. So that's, yeah. it's like a fundamental part, not just in terms of our own practice, but also of, of process for how we work with other people and with our communities to try to address yeah. things. Yeah. 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 It's that's, awesome. that's knowing the intention, the purity of intention. Right. Is yeah, I mean, I could feel... Uh, is it born of wanting? Yeah. Is it born yeah. of bewilderment? Or is it born of generosity, kindness, uh, and intuitive yeah. understanding? It makes mm -hmm. a huge difference. I, I felt all of it. Ah. You know, I, I mean, I wanted to, to stop for all of the above reasons and because mo mo most of all, I just cared too much to hear the suffering, but yeah. And just like in the past question of like, there is the level at which it isn't just about this calf and this cow. It, it, it isn't, that separation isn't there. It's the grief of our own, of being separated from that which we love and that which is mm -hmm. pleasant. And that's what we care about our own mother, our internal mm -hmm. mother, or just that sense of what that might mean or our child or our inner child or whatever. It's like yeah. that grief doesn't need to be about the cow and the, and the calf. It's, in, it's here. It's happening right here, you know, and that mm -hmm. it's powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. There's oh, nothing, sadi, nothing sadi. like a crying baby. Thank you. <laughs> or kitty. Or kitty. Yeah. Well, or they say cats, the reason cats sometimes sound like baby human babies they feel mm -hmm. like or i've read about places where that's that's an evolutionary trait because humans cannot stand the sound of a crying baby without attending to it and cats right. learn to mimic that over millions of years so that we 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 feed them <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lot we all have sense. our version of that yeah yeah thank you mm, thank you thank you all right, folks, um, I think that's probably our time. But really just, again, wonderful to be here with you all this week again, and that we can build this sort of continuity over time. It's really beautiful. Really appreciate your practice and your attention and your presence. It means a lot to us. It means everything. Keep mm. going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Keep investigating with wisdom. <laughs> this is such a different way of teaching, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. And practicing. <laughs> compassion, compassion. Yeah, right. Oh, I didn't have 
think I'm the... Anukampa Karuna. I'm heading out. Anukampa Karuna. <laughs> oh, here we go.